Good morning, church. Good morning, church here and church online. It's good to have you. Good to see you. Well, here we are. Uh, season 12, Finding God in the Music. Our theme, songs that make you what? Think. We don't mind thinking, do we? Especially if it goes along with a good tune. All right, this is track five of season 12. We only got one more Sunday. Next Sunday is, is the last one, but we, we've got track five today. And who is the artist? Hmm. I gave a, I gave a little hint. I said, uh, Canadian songwriter, not Neil Young. Okay, so who are we talking about? Well, this artist is, uh, this artist is in my top ten pantheon. Actually, number seven. I have them all worked out, you know. And uh, this artist occupies the seventh position in BZ's music pantheon. Uh, this is this artist's third appearance in Finding God in the Music. Uh, first time was in 2013, and then again the following year, 2014. Uh, Canadian, not Neil Young. Any guesses? Canadian, not Neil Young songwriter. Any guesses? Bruce Coburn, I heard it, that's right. Bruce Coburn. And uh, there's young Bruce Coburn. Uh, he's 75 now, but, you know, I thought we ought to at least, you know, have enough respect to see him as a young man. <laughs> Bruce Coburn, and now he's not a young man. In his 40-year recording career, he's released 33 albums. Uh, 22 of them have been gold or platinum, and he's received... Every honor and the highest honor that Canada can give to performing artists. Uh, he's known somewhat in the U.S. He's very well known in Canada. Uh, the U.S. should catch up with Canada and become more aware of the great artist Brutus, Bruce Coburn. Uh, he's, he's one of those kind of artists that is influential and admired by other artists. You too frequently speaks of how much they admire Bruce Coburn. In fact, Bruce... Coburn shows up in one of their songs. In their song, God Part Two, Bono sings, I heard a singer late last night on the radio. Let's see, I'm going to get it right. Got to get the rhyme right. Heard a singer on the radio late last night says he's going to kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. Well, that's referring to Bruce Coburn. His song, Lovers in a Dangerous Time. That's our theme song, Perry. We have a theme. That's it. Lovers in a Dangerous Time. And uh, that song has, that's a great song, and that song has the line in there, anything, everything worth having, let me get it right here, uh, nothing worth having comes without some kind of fight, got to kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight. All right, and, and uh, Bruce Coburn is, he's a Christian, he's a believer, had an encounter with Jesus way back in the 70s, and his music is... And his lyrics are saturated with Christian themes. He, he, he lives in San Francisco. He's Canadian, but he lives in the U.S. He and his wife live in San Francisco where he is involved with Lighthouse Church there. And uh, I, I don't know the pastor there, but I have friends that do. And so uh, that's good to know. And what song am I picking? I'm picking the song called Call Me Rose. This is from his 2011 album. Uh, small source of comfort. So it's a you know, relatively recent song. It's not from the 70s or 80s or whatever. This is uh, from 2011, Call Me Rose. He says that this song just basically came to him in a dream. He just woke up and he had the song. Woke up and it was there and he wrote it in a matter of minutes. It just came to him like, like downloaded a, a song. Uh, this song has one of the greatest opening lines of any song I've ever heard. It, it, the very opening line is humorous and it makes you think. And the way he starts is on there's no music intro. It just, he sings that first line and it gets your attention. Uh, I don't think I want to talk about the song now. I think I want you to hear it first. Remember, uh, those of you, you know, viewing online, we have to mute this part, but there are ways for you to find Call Me Rose on the internet and there'll be links and you'll figure all that out. All right, it's not very long, it's about three minutes long, so uh, Bruce Coburn, Call Me Rose. My name was Richard Nixon, only now I'm a girl. You wouldn't know it, but I used to be the king of the world. Compared to last time, I look like I've hit the skin. Project with my two little kids. It's not what I would have chose. Now you have to call me Rose. 
appreciation, Bruce Cobar. My name was Richard Nixon, only now I'm a girl. What a great starting line to a song. This is Bruce Coburn giving us a story of Richard Nixon come back, this time, as a single mother of two living in the projects. It is, in fact, a literary device to help us imagine the judgment seat of Christ. My name was Richard Nixon, only now I'm a girl. You wouldn't know it, but I used to be the king of the world. Compared to last time, I look like I've hit the skids living in the project with my two little kids. It's not what I would have chose. Now you have to call me Rose. It's a, an imagination of a divine reversal. Reminds me a little bit of Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where there is a divine reversal. I dealt with that in our second track with the call song, You Were There. Second verse, I was the boss of bosses the last time around. I lived by cunning and ambition unbound. That's, that's Nixon, tricky dick. The suckers said they'd stand behind me, right or wrong, as if they thought that hubris was the mark of the strong. You know that word hubris? It's a Greek word. I mean, it's in English, but it comes from the Greek. And it means not just pride, not just arrogance, but outrageous arrogance that offends even the gods. It's just, it's off the charts arrogance. The suckers said, they, said they'd stand behind me, right or wrong, as if they thought that hubris was the mark of the strong. I was an arrogant man. But now I've got it in hand. It's not what I would have chose. Now you have to call me Rose. You know, we all eventually have to face what we've made of ourselves in our life. And he has to face, I was an arrogant man, but now I've got it in hand. My name was Richard Nixon, only now I'm a girl. You wouldn't know it, but I used to be the king of the world. I'm back here learning what it is to be poor. To have no power but the strength to endure. Whew. How much of the Bible is a prophetic advocation for the people who have no power but the strength to endure? That's Exodus. That's incorporated in the law. That's what the prophets are going on and on about. It's what Jesus has to say. It's what the apostles have to say. The Bible is a consistent prophetic advocation for those who have no power except the strength to endure. I'll perform my penance well. Maybe the memoir will sell. And you're like, oh, I thought he was making progress. I thought his soul was growing. I thought he was expanding. And, but now he's, no, he's slipped back into, I, maybe I can monetize this. Maybe the memoir will sell. It's not what I would have chose. Now you have to call me Rose. So, Pastor Brian Zahn, how are you going to preach from that one? It won't be hard. I'm going to go to the Sermon on the Mount. What do you say? Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus. This is our Lord talking to us. This is our Master, our King, our Leader our teacher, our savior, this is Jesus. And he says, in everything, do to Rose, I mean, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are a few who find it. The Sermon on the Mount. It cannot be overemphasized how important it is. And it's hard to emphasize or overemphasize how much it's been ignored by and large throughout church history, at least the last 17 centuries. The Sermon on the Mount, in fact, is the Constitution of the Kingdom of Christ. You know how some people like to go on and on about the Constitution. Well, this is the Constitution for the Christian. This is the Constitution of the Kingdom of Christ. And either, either we take the Sermon on the Mount seriously or we hear Jesus say to us, 
Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't even do what I say? That shows up. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you're not even going to do what I say? Ten years ago, I preached on the Sermon on the Mount for four months. I mean, I took it at that pace. Four months going through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And every single Sunday, I would have someone come up to me and say, Are you saying? And I would always say, I'm trying real hard not to say anything. I'm just letting Jesus say something. But I found it interesting that it was very clear. That four months on the Sermon on the Mount made, a, not, not you all because, you know, you survived the purge. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it made a lot of people uncomfortable. And, and in their cognitive dissonance, they wanted to say, it's Pastor Brian making me uncomfortable. But it wasn't. Because really I was doing my very best to stay out of the way and let Jesus say what he wanted to say. And it was Jesus who was making people uncomfortable Preaching the Sermon on the Mount. So you know how it starts. It starts with the Beatitudes. The eightfold announcement of those who are best positioned to receive the kingdom of God as good news. Because not everybody receives it as good news. That's thus the nervousness and being uncomfortable and the fidgeting. And I don't know if I really like this. I'm supposed to like Jesus, but I don't know if I like his ideas. I want him to save me, but you know, I don't know if I want him to run the government. <laughs> and so Jesus begins his, his Sermon on the Mountain by announcing those that are lucky enough to be positioned best to be blessed with the arrival of the kingdom he's proclaiming. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for righteousness, for the world to be set right, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see and perceive God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for justice, for righteousness, for all the right reasons, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on and he says, next thing he says is he says, he talks about light and salt a little bit. And then he says, he says, don't think, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. Oh no, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. In other words, the goal of the prophets and the goal of the law is fulfilled with what Jesus is bringing. Jesus is announcing and enacting the kingdom of God. And when people hear that and they draw near to Jesus and they begin to live according to the kingdom way that Jesus is proclaiming, Jesus says this is the fulfillment of all that the law and the prophets dreamed of and aimed for. And then he preaches his sermon, which has a lot to do with Living in light and love and prayer without pretense and nonviolence and true worship. But it goes on for three chapters. And now he's coming in for a landing. He's going to, after this a little bit here, he's going to say a few things about don't, get, don't, don't be deceived by those that, you know, would ignore this. Don't be deceived by false prophets. And worst of all, don't deceive yourself. And then he says, you know... He, he, you're hearing this. Now, if you do it, you're building your life on a rock and you'll stand strong. But if you hear this and you just don't do it, you hear it, but you don't do it, you're building your life on sand and the whole thing's going to get destroyed. But as Jesus really is wanting to conclude his sermon, this is what he says. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus is not coming to abolish the law and the prophets. He's coming to fulfill it. And he says you do that by in everything do to others as you would have them do to you. So, hey, Richard Nixon, sitting there in the White House, you have to consider Rose living across town in the projects. You have to. Now, what is the message of the law and the prophets? Jesus mentions the law and the prophets at the beginning and conclusion of his sermon. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And then he says, 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For this is the law and the prophets. Well, what are the law and the prophets doing? What are they up to? What are they saying? They have one message. And it is the message to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. They say it in lots of different ways. It gets incorporated into the law in different ways. But that's the driving force behind it all. That we are called to love God supremely. Anything less than that's idolatry. And we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Anything less than that is injustice. So that's the law and the prophets. To love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in this famous verse, Jesus is inviting us into a contemplative exercise in order to fulfill the second commandment. That to love our neighbor as ourselves is to do unto them as we would want to be done unto us if we were in their place. So it's an invitation for Richard Nixon to contemplate what it would like to be Rose. And if he's Rose, what does he want the president to what does she want the president to do? If you understand what I'm saying. We have to contemplate what it would like to be the other. And that's not always easy. Because I've spent all of my 61 years inside this skin. You can tell. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've, I've just, I'm here. I'm, 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 and if I, don't, if I don't learn how to pray and sit with Jesus and engage in contemplative exercises, then I'm just, I'm trapped here. And I, Jesus says, no, BZ, you've got to learn how to inhabit someone else's experience. So, see, we're not, in loving the neighbor as ourselves, we're not called to treat them as we think they ought to be treated. We're to treat them as we would want to be treated if we were in their place. So that that means you have to take a journey. Okay, okay, Richard Nixon, you're going to have to contemplate. You're going to have to come out of the White House and land in a housing project with your two little kids. Now, how do you want to be treated? That's what Jesus calls us to do. That's the law and the prophets. Um. This is what Bruce Coburn's brilliant song is about. It, it makes you think. Richard Nixon is forced in the song. It's not just an invitation. He's for, he has no choice. You know, it's a, it's a, he wakes up and says, oh, my goodness. I'm not in Richard Nixon's skin anymore. I'm a, I'm a woman. I'm poor. I got two kids. I'm in the projects. And instead of being rich, powerful, and important, he's poor, powerless, and overlooked. And he has to contemplate what it's like to be that. He has no choice because he's going to live it now. So my sermon really is this. If you can inhabit the experience of the one who is radically other than yourself through contemplation, then and only then can you begin to love the other as you love yourself and thus advocate for justice on their behalf. That's the sermon in a, in a sentence. If you can inhabit the experience of the one who is radically other than you through contemplation, and not just through, con- I mean, contemplation is, is an exercise, and I'll talk about that, but sometimes what you really have to do is just listen. Yeah. Just listen to them. Say, okay, you're in that situation, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, here's, here's, what you need, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to think about this. At first, you just need to listen to them talk about what their life is like, what their experience, you have to hear that. And that will open the door through a, for the possibility, anyway, of a contemplative exercise where you can begin to... Uh, inhabit their space and thus begin to love the other as you love yourself and advocate for justice on their behalf. I learned how to do this to a certain extent back in the days of traveling and staying in hotels. Hopefully those days are going to come back. But you know, I, I went for a very, very long time where certainly every month, and sometimes week after week, I'd have a night or two in a hotel room. And you know how hotels are. I mean, they're, they're different than when you're at home. At home, I make the bed. At the hotel, I don't. I just get out and I don't make it. And I go about my day, I do what I do, and I come back and magically it's made. And it's cleaned up. 
and the room's got, and all those little, all those little shampoo bottles are, are back in place. And everything's straightened up. Well, you know, that happens because there is, there is a person, a housekeeper that's doing that. Well, so I was sitting with Jesus one day, as I do, you know, my time of prayer, there's a, my morning liturgy of prayer, there, there's a time where, where I just sit with Jesus. I just sit with Jesus. I'm not, I'm, I'm not using words anymore. I'm just, I'm just present to Christ. And most of the time, you know, that's just what it is. I'm, pr- I'm present with Christ. Christ is salvation. He is wisdom. He is life. And that just radiates upon me. But occasionally something happens. And one time, um, Jesus led me to think about how it is that my bed got made in the hotel and the, and the shampoo bottles got replaced. And I thought, oh... Because there's somebody that does that. See, it's too, it's too easy to be in the hotel and you're just walking down the hall. And it's, you know, room, elevator, ice maker, housekeeper. Just like an object. And so I, I thought, okay, so I started trying to, because I'd seen her. It was, a, it was a her. I don't know her name. Let's give her a name. Let's call her Rose. Let's call her Rosa. Rosa Rodriguez. And I'm gonna, she's going to be other than I am. What am I? I am a white male. I'm still claiming I'm middle-aged. I don't know if you can be middle-aged in your 60s. You can, because I am. All right. Might even try to go for young. I don't know. A little bit of... Okay. So I'm white, male, 60, middle class, U.S. citizen, all of that. And uh, Rosa, Rosa Rodriguez in my contemplative exercise that Jesus was leading me in. She, I don't know this, but I mean, it's entirely possible, you know, how many Hampton Inns this is the situation. Where the housekeeper is female, it's not my experience. Honduran, it's not my experience. Poor, it's not my experience. Single mother, not my experience. Undocumented, not my experience. Doesn't speak English or doesn't speak English well, not my experience. So she's completely opposite of what I am. And now I have to try. It's not, okay, Brian, think how you should treat her, how you should treat her. How you, no, no, that is what Jesus calls us to do. Because still we're there and we're in charge. You, Jesus calls us to somehow inhabit that experience. So I've got to try to think, okay, I'm living in the projects with my two little kids. And I'm nervous because I'm undocumented, but I'm just trying to give them a good life. And I'm working hard at the Hampton Inn, and I'm cleaning rooms. And there's this guy staying in there, this old guy with a white beard. And, and, but, but I know he's, he's a Christian because he's got a Bible in there and everything. And um, how do I want that guy to treat me? I think, okay. I think I would like for him to acknowledge my existence. Not just walk past me like I'm the ice maker. I would like him to acknowledge that I exist and that I have worth and I have dignity. So I want him to acknowledge me. And uh, how else? Okay, I'm Rosa Rodriguez. How do I want that guy? Uh, Be nice if he would smile at me. Be nice if he'd say good morning. Be better if he'd say buenos dias. Be fantastic if he'd leave a tip. That would be, that would really elevate my opinion of that guy. I would like that. Now, Jesus says to me, he says, BZ, do that. All that stuff that you just laid out, do that. And I go, why? He says, because it's the law and the prophets, man. It's the whole message. Have you been paying attention? This is what you are to do. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Hmm. Everybody listen up. Everybody listen up. 
The narrow way is not a sinner's prayer. The narrow way is not a sinner's prayer. The narrow way is not a sinner's prayer because a sinner's prayer is easy. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Amen. That's easy. The narrow gate is the golden rule. The narrow gate is what I've just been describing. It's what Jesus has just been saying. He says, all right, come on, folks. I'm, bring, I'm, I'm closing my sermon, Jesus says. I'm closing my sermon. Here's what I want you to get. Whatever you want people to do to you, you do to them. That's the law and the prophet. Enter by the narrow gate. Because there's a wide gate that's easy. It's broad and it's easy and that's the way most people go. But the gate that's narrow, it leads to a road that's hard and, and few are willing to do it. But it leads to life. The other leads to destruction. The golden rule is the narrow gate. It's not simply a mental ascent to a prayer. It's not simply believing something about Jesus. Truth is not a laminated card you carry in your pocket. Truth is a long, hard road and you have to walk it. And so, Jesus invites us to not go the way of the crowd. Most people live according to us versus them. We're, we're just scripted in it. We, we didn't take a class on it, per se, except that our whole life experience has been mostly a class on it. And nobody is explicit on it, but it gets taught to us that we are an us and they are a them. And what we do with our anger and our insecurity and our fear, our anxiety and our rage is we gather it together and we blame it on them. We project it on them. And it makes us all feel better and makes us happy in our group. Except Jesus says, you can't do that and be my disciple. We can't go that way. Jesus says, though, that is the way most people go. That's easy. There's a big, huge, wide gate that leads to that big, wide road. And it's an easy road to follow. And it's what the vast majority of people do. But it also leads to destruction. It leads, what does it lead to? Destruction. Destruction of what? Well, first of all, your soul. It's destroying you. It's destroying you. That's in our gospel reading today. Jesus says, if anybody wants to be my disciple, anybody want to be a disciple of Jesus? If anybody wants to be my disciple, let him take up his cross. Follow me. If you seek to save your life, if you prioritize your life, if you try to position yourself so it's advantageous for you, he says you lose everything. But if you lose your so-called life for me, You'll find your real life. And besides, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world but lose their soul? And so the wide, easy road of blaming the other, being against the other, in fact, is the road that leads to the destruction of your soul. But not only does the wide road of self-centered us versus them lead to the destruction of your soul. It also leads to the destruction of nations and societies. This is where wars and revolutions come from, and so we better listen to Jesus. This nation better listen to Jesus, or it's on its wide road to destruction. Now the Hebrew prophets, their task was to call Israel to fidelity in their worship of God and call them to justice in how they treat their neighbors. And the Hebrew prophet said over and over in all their poetic, creative ways, they say this, they say, you got to worship God to love God with all your heart, and then you have to live that devotion out by treating your neighbor neighborly. But if you're going to treat your neighbor with injustice, don't even bother with the worship part. They say that over and over. If you're not going to treat your neighbor just as, don't, you, don't come be singing your songs. God says, I hate them. Ugh. Don't sing your songs. I don't want to hear your songs. I don't want your sacrifices. I want mercy and I want justice. That's what I want. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Do justice, love, mercy, walk humbly with God. Now, if your worship of God forms you in that, great. Then bring your song and worship God. But if it doesn't lead to that, God says, ah, don't even bother because it annoys me. And so we have an example of this in Isaiah 58. 
where the prophet Isaiah is speaking in the name of the Lord, and they, they've kind of been going on about how, you know, we're so devout because we, we practice our fast days. And in our, in our liturgical calendar, calendar we, have, we have feast days and we have fast days, and we're very devoted to our fast days. We're very good at fasting. And this is what the prophet in the name of the Lord says. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice. To free those wrongly imprisoned. Yeah, that stuff's in the Bible. To free those wrongly imprisoned. Makes me think of like the Innocence Project. Makes me think of Brian Stevenson and Just Mercy. Perry will say you got to read the book. I'll let you off the hook if you watch the movie. Okay. Perry said, okay, we made a deal. I made a deal for you. You don't have to read the book as long as you watch the movie. Just Mercy, Brian Stevenson. So that's in the Bible. To free those wrongly imprisoned, to undo heavy burdens, to set the oppressed free and remove the chains that bind people. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to give shelter to the homeless, to give clothes to those who need them and not turn away from your own kin? Because they're not other. They're your brother and sister. They're your own kin. Then, then your salvation will come like the dawn and your healing will come quickly. Do we want to have healing in our soul, in our society, in our nation? Then we have to do this stuff. So years ago, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, maybe more, I don't know. I don't remember. We started a thing called Project 58 where we invited people to do two things. One, to fast Okay, to fast, we call it Project 58 after Isaiah 58. To fast one meal a week, the Friday lunch meal, as a stance of prophetic resistance against the idol of consumerism in our culture. To fast one meal, the Friday meal, and then to take the money you save from the Friday meal and put it in one of our Project 58 boxes that would then be used, we would distribute to the poor to feed them, to clothe them, to house them. And for however many years we've been doing it, I don't, I don't really know. I think it's at least 10, maybe more. Uh, we have, in the name of Jesus, worked miracles for people, for Rose. It all goes to Rose. You understand? Come on, play along with me. It all goes to Rose living in the projects with her two little kids to keep her lights on, to clothe them, to help them out. And... As a part of what we do, as a, as a part of that whole thing, there's Project Backpack. Because Rose got her two little kids, and they're getting ready to go back to school, but they don't have the supplies, and they don't have the money to go and buy a new backpack and get the glue and the scissors and the pencils and the crayons and, yeah, all the stuff. And so think about that. You know, Rose's two little kids got to show up, and they don't have the stuff that the other kids have. And shame is heaped upon them, and their hard lives already harder. And so what we do is we cooperate with two schools, and we send our people out, you go out, people go out, and they got a shopping list, and they buy the stuff, buy the pack, bring it here, put it in there, and we take it and we give them to them. Uh, Megan Taylor is our social justice director. Ah, she does a lot of things because, you know, you're here on staff at Word of Life Church. You wear more than one hat. Right now, I think she's back there doing the host on Facebook. So all you people on Facebook, say hi to Megan. <laughs> and, uh, but here, I want, I, want, I want Megan to come via video and explain to us a little bit about Project Backpack. This is our 13th year for our annual school supply drive we call Project Backpack. We are once again partnering with Lindbergh Elementary and Rubidoux Middle School to provide much needed school supplies for students who would otherwise be left without the tools needed for their education. Every year, teachers in these schools express their overwhelming gratitude for our support, as they are usually the ones bearing the burden of figuring out how to help students who show up without supplies. I want to invite you to join us in this important work. To participate, simply stop by the table in the foyer, pick up a supply list, and go shopping. After you've shopped for your child's supplies, bring your backpack back to the church and drop it here at the table in the foyer. If you're watching online this morning, visit wolc.com and look for the Project Backpack link on our homepage to find out how you can participate as well. 
All donations and supplies are due back by next Sunday, September 6th. Let's rally together during these hard times to care for the children of our city. Amen, what a good thing. And so we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the deeds done in the body. And I promise you that Jesus will, in the evaluation of your life, bring up Rose. Yeah, but what about Rose? I, I, I went to church every Sunday. Yeah, I know, but what about Rose? Yeah, but I loved you with all my heart. Yeah, but what about Rose? Rose who? You know Rose living in the projects, but to the... Oh, so that was important. Yeah, that was important. So we, have some, we can do something about it to, this week. You can go shopping, shopping in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of you are just born for that. You've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And you're, you're going to get your shopping list and you're going to go, put on your mask, go into, the, go into Walmart or wherever you go and you're going to buy that pack and, da, 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 and you're going to fill it all up and you're going to come back here and bring it. It's going to be great. You got next Sunday. It's got to be back here by next Sunday. Those of you online are not left out. You can, you know, the, just do what Megan said and you can get the shopping list and go do that. If you're like in Kalamazoo or something and it's hard for you to get to St. Joe before next Sunday. Uh, you can just make a donation to Project 58. Thank you very much. Amen. So everybody can participate. Feel good about this? Is that okay, sermon? I liked it. I liked it. Yeah, that's me being pathetic there, but I did like it. And I like Bruce Coburn, and I like that song, but Jesus says, what I really want y'all to do is love Rose. Love Rose. 